Welcome to Jewel Media. My name is Ching Jewel. Happy New Year! Today is the first day of Lunar New Year. Uh, I have been doing this uh, live interview for almost four years now, and I have met so many wonderful filmmakers, musicians, politicians, entrepreneurs, you name it. And today, my special guest is Karena Bonganze. Thank you so much. Let's welcome. Thank you for having me, Ching. Thank you. So happy yeah. to be so say it again, your name. Uh, it's, it's a challenge for me. <laughs> Thank you for trying. Karine Bogosian. Karine Bogosian. Karine Bogosian. All right, you guys uh, practice. Um, yes, thank you so much for being my guest. And how, how are you doing? I'm very well. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. Can, do you want to learn a word, Happy New Year in Chinese? I would love that. Xing Nian Hao. Xing Nian Hao. Very good. You see, your musicians have a very good uh, ear. Xing means new. Mm. Nian means year. year. Hao is good. Xing Nian Hao. Oh, very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so you have a very impressive um, CV, impressive uh, you know performance history and teaching and um, uh, education and so I I, I wanted to uh, ask you about where is all these come from like it, did you grow up in a musician's family? I am very grateful of uh, the inspiration I received from my parents. My uh, mom is a huge music lover though by profession she's an engineer and my father is an incredible artist Vlasmik Polosian and uh, I basically grew up in his art studio watching him paint and uh, seeing him communicate with uh, fellow creatives. So the arts were in my life from the very, very beginning. So how did the piano playing start? You know, it's interesting. Um, my parents took me to piano as I think so many parents do, just, just so I have a little bit of musical uh, training, there was absolutely no intention for me to go full professional into music, but uh, somehow around the age of uh, 13, 14, I began to really connect with it and um, yeah, and then it became my fate, my path. So. so how was your early training? Do you feel early training foundation is very important? Because you know why I ask that is my mother was a piano teacher. Wow. Yeah. So how, who, who, maybe you have a bunch of uh, early teacher, like, uh, are they like a really strict, like a Russian teachers or? Oh my gosh. Yes. The, the Soviet school. Absolutely. I went through that. Well, <laughs> well, the very peculiar thing about my uh, early stages is that I was a horrible, horrible student and I was very lazy. I hated practicing. I really loved playing and just improvising just for fun. But uh, the first five, six years were incredibly unproductive. Um, and there's a possibility that I didn't really connect with my first teacher and there wasn't that rapport. And I just uh, never felt like I'm good enough anyway. Uh, and then I had an interesting moment where uh, a new teacher came into my life who just was so encouraging. I mean, she just really gave me wings and I, became absolutely madly in love with the time I was spending at the piano practicing and exploring. So um, I'm deeply grateful to that particular teacher because I'm here right now doing what I'm doing thanks to, to that change. Yeah, that's very interesting because sometimes we do not realize uh, that a very good teacher, a method uh, not only the method fits you and also personality. And also mm -hmm. I think in, as my background, like teachers, mostly they criti criticize us, mm -hmm. not an encouragement environment. Like I think in the Western world, mm -hmm. uh, American way of teaching uh, mm -hmm. is more encouraging. I, and I think it's so important, right? Mm -hmm. To, to mm -hmm. draw the best out of your students mm -hmm. rather than always like, you know, criticize, criticize, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with that um, 
severe way of teaching. And it was a, such a culture shock when I came to the U.S. because uh, I would very rarely hear back home uh, such such terms as, oh, good job. That was the you know, job well done. It's, it's very unfamiliar to us. But I have to say at the same time, there is a positive to it because it does really make you incredibly driven um, and not easily satisfied, which you sort of need as an artist. You have to be so tough and self-motivated. Um, so that uh, part of it was very productive and helpful to me. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So um, may I ask, like, uh, when did you arrive in the United States? I came uh, with my parents all the way back in 1998. And uh, went to California, did my bachelor's uh, degree studies at the Cal State Northridge, which uh, was an extraordinary experience. And then my teacher there, Professor Regnan, who was another angelic uh, and incredibly encouraging figure in my life, inspired and nudged me to uh, come to the East Coast for my master's. So I came and auditioned and uh, was accepted to Manhattan School of Music and did my master's and doctorate then here at MSM and uh, stayed in, in New York. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Now, you have gone through so so many, uh, you know, academia, you have also a DMA. Mm -hmm. And what was your intention when you get DMA? Did you uh, want to be a performer, but also want to be a teacher, want to be a <laughs> scholar? That's a fascinating question because I have always felt the happiest when I'm on the stage. It is just one of those things that I don't think it's teachable. You just have that inside when you're in this particular space uh, on the stage with these big lights and all the beautiful people in the audience. I just come to life in a way that nowhere else uh, I feel. Sure. Like, like, <laughs> you're so oh, off. <laughs> At the same time, <laughs> at the same time it's, it's really fascinating because from a very early age, I also was a bit of a music nerd, a music history nerd. And it just always fascinated me to dig into a composer's life or their uh, whatever was happening in that moment in their life when they were writing that piece and make that personal connection. And so it was just such a natural kind of step for me to go into DMA because I got to do that for two years. Um, I did make sure I get in, get out for uh, a, as, as short a period of time as I possibly could. So I graduated my DMA in two years and wrote the thesis and everything. It was insanely challenging two years. Uh, it's a bit of a blur. I don't remember much of it, <laughs> but- well, Excuse me, dear. Tell people if they don't know, what is a DMA? <laughs> yes, it's Doctor of Musical Arts. It's basically the highest um, degree, academic degree, uh, if you're pursuing music education. Uh, and it requires you to do simultaneously a, a very, very um, hefty uh, amount of academic work, research and writing, um, as well as actively perform already. So, what was your uh, what was your dis dissertation topic? My actual thesis was on my compatriot Adam Khachaturian, and I wrote about his uh, piano works. And oh, then, that's so nerdy! <laughs> this incredible natural kind of uh, of course I should write about this. And that, it just naturally led me to actually learn all of the material I had researched and um, explored. And then I decided to put together a recital. And after that recital, I got a record deal from Naxos and my first CD um, came out, all, all leading like a chain reaction all the way back mm -hmm. from my thesis. So That's wonderful. You know, I always believe one thing leads to another. So that's so, kind so. of like my tagline, you know. One oh, yeah. thing. So if you don't do that one thing, and then mm -hmm. possibly you have nothing after that, right? So awesome. it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. Now, um, you've done a lot of uh, not only performance, and you are kind of a, like a social media uh, buff and uh, influencer. Uh, you did. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have like, what, 14K people We're on, on you. Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so tell us a little bit about your monthly recital uh, mm -hmm. broadcast series that you created. Thank you so much for asking me because it is one of the proudest uh, 
accomplishments of, of my life. I'm so proud of these beautiful series. So once a month on a platform called Patreon, I host a, uh, a lecture recital. Um, I do these on Zoom, but they're professionally broadcast from various beautiful studios and, um, you know, with the help of amazing professional engineers. And uh, there's usually a particular theme. So, for example, the first four recitals of this uh, year are themed Vienna. So we started with Schubert in January, and then next one coming up February 25th is uh, a beautiful uh, Haydn piano sonata afternoon. And uh, the viewers are able to tune in from all over the world. I have some loyal family members there from, uh, I call them my Patreon family, and they truly are such wonderful, loyal supporters of my work uh, and champions of my work. And uh, some of them are tuning in from Australia, all across US, Canada. And for that one hour on the last Sunday of each month, they get to not only come together and enjoy this uh, beautiful live broadcast, but they also get to interact in the Zoom chat with one another and get to reconnect. So it's just the most inspiring, beautiful experience once a month that I get to have. And I'm very proud of it. Yeah, we have a flyer in front of you. Did you see it? Yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> of course, of course, beautiful. Yeah, so um, the next one is on February 20, 25th, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Last Sunday of February, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's all hiding. So how, how, do you, um, how do you do this uh, session, like in terms of audio? Are there any, were there any challenge when you try to deliver your music to people? Yes, well, uh, it all started during the pandemic, um, as quite similar to your beautiful <laughs> podcast. You started completely from uh, just uh, your own uh, devices. I used my own laptop. And then little by little, I built it up to be able to do them from actual professional studios. I'm incredibly grateful. I actually received some funding this year for the first time. I have a sponsor. And thanks to this wonderful sponsor, um, Tetana Zayan, I'm able to actually hire amazing uh, professional engineers who help me with the audio setting and video uh, production. Last one in January was a seven camera video production. It was just so incredibly beautiful uh, from the Broadway Presbyterian Church. And the venue changes each month, which also adds to the uh, kind of novelty and experience each time it's something unique. Wow, that's wonderful, wonderful. So um, now I wanted to talk, uh, emphasize um, this major project is coming up, which is next uh, Wednesday. Yeah? Yes. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Um, yeah, so you have played in Carnegie Hall several times, like a, a, a Zenger Hall and mm -hmm. also Y Recital Hall. And what is this time um, different from <laughs> other performances other than it's a Valentine's Day? It's very interesting because it uh, began, uh, um, the whole program in my mind began with wanting to celebrate a piece that I have loved for the longest time, which is, of course, the iconic Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin. And uh, it is the 100th anniversary of the premiere of that piece two days from today, February 12th, 1924, it was premiered. And uh, as I was researching the, the possibility of doing some sort of a jazz themed program that would conclude with the grand finale being the Rhapsody, um, this opportunity came up to, to do it on the 14th. Uh, so it just was one of those cosmic uh, magical coincidences that a lot of things came together and here we are doing a Valentine's Day jazzy recital. I'm so excited. It's definitely a first for me. So um, can you name uh, the uh, list of the repertoire you're doing? Mm -hmm. It's pretty, pretty, what do you call, ambitious uh, list, so, gigantic program. It's a feisty one. It's going to be a long time <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because it, it's it's all um the five very very different composers from very different parts of the world and yet somehow they just so magically work together it's just a very coherent 
bunch. So mm -hmm. it begins with Alberto Ginastera's Piano Sonata Number no. 1, which I absolutely adore. Uh, and Ginastera is a fascinating composer who very much dabbled in 20th century modernist devices such as polytonality, for example, and, and clusters and quartal harmonies and whatnot. But at the same time, he also stayed very true to his roots and loved to use Argentinian folk elements and dance rhythms. Um, so that, that sonata is just a, a, a glorious example of, of his style. Uh, then I proceed on to a composer whose work I very recently discovered and fell in love with, Samuel Kohlers-Taylor, a beautiful Afro-English composer who uh, had a, a big rise uh, and a successful kind of start to his career in the UK, but then Early on, he came to the U.S. in early 1900s and was able to communicate with uh, the African-American community here in the U.S. And it did something to him. It just gave him the most extraordinary uh, inspiration. It was almost as though he was reborn and went back and started to compose in a new way, incorporating some of these um, African-American spiritual elements, uh, these various uh, dance rhythms that you would hear, like a juba rhythm that, uh, of course, as we know, inspired Dvorak so much in his New World Symphony. So it's so interesting to explore his piano music. He uh, wrote uh, these six beautiful waltzes called Three Fours, and I'm uh, playing two uh, of my absolute favorites out of that set. And then the third composer is a wonderful, uh, amazing female composer that I am so inspired by, Tanya Leon. She's a, a Cuban-American composer who is an absolute trailblazer, one of the most important musical figures of our time, uh, I think you can easily say. But it's extraordinary to read about her early uh, struggles. She came here as a refugee after the big uh, Fidel Castro revolution in Cuba, and she was really struggling at first and was building and kind of clawing her way into the music world, uh, just founding new orchestras, founding new, uh, she helped found the um, Harlem uh, Dance uh, Theater completely from, from ground, and it's just inspiring to study uh, the lives and the works of people like that and you just feel so motivated as an artist so i'm playing a beautiful piece of hers called tumbao and just like hinastera it also has a lot of these uh, fascinating folk influences and latin dance rhythms that she incorporates so very uh, excited to play that um the fourth composer is my compatriot arno babajanian and uh I have a very special personal relationship to Baba Jan because I uh, won a competition back home in Yerevan and I had to, for this competition, I had to do a whole bunch of material and it just has been my true loyal friend, his music. Um, his style is a bit similar to Alberto Ginastera. Just like Ginastera, he also dabbles in Armenian folk elements and folk tunes. Um, in fact, he quotes in a couple of the pieces, uh, he actually quotes um, uh, some familiar older tunes. Like, if you like, I can share with you his, uh, the last piece in, uh, in the group. It's called Dance of Parashapat. And in this piece, he actually um, quotes a, a beloved, beloved tune that has been used by so many other Armenian composers, including Komitas. And uh, the tune itself is... How can you walk us a little bit about how you prepare a concert like this in Carnegie Hall, Wire Side of Hall? What 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 are the most challenging things for you as a performing artist? Um, oh my gosh, what a what a beautiful and important question. Really, the most important thing is making sure uh, I am physically at my best. So the number one thing I do, I'm a bit of a workaholic and I like to do a lot of things uh, as, as I'm sure uh, the same with, with you, you have to be very mindful and not take on 
uh, all the things that you're excited by and really save some time. So the single biggest challenge for me, believe it or not, is actually being able to not do something, being able to actually give myself a chance to breathe, a chance to get extra sleep. Uh, those are so, so significant to be able to actually get up on the stage and give it your all. Um, otherwise, the actual practical side of it, practicing and doing analysis of each piece and research on each piece, that is fun for me. I could do that uh, nonstop, but I really love really to work hard to make sure I'm at my best and I have uh, rested well and eating properly. Um, just kind of being a mommy in a way to your own self. <laughs> That's really the hardest thing of all. So well said. So well said. Yeah. Sometimes we know how to take care of other people, but then we do not take care of ourselves in yeah. many different, you know, detailed way. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. such a great, great uh, insight and advice. Now with the social media, are you always uh, good with the social media thing, like, or you, like, you have to sort of be pushed to do this thing for, for you to promote yourselves or to, you know, get your musics, you know, out. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel social media and how did you get so good at that? Oh my gosh. I, uh, first of all, I'm flattered that you think I'm good at it. Uh, <laughs> very kind of you. I don't, I don't know if I am. Um, it really, I think again, the pandemic was a, a nudge to, use it as a way to just uh, keep sharing my work. Um, when that very first week when the shutdown happened, I just threw out there, um, I think on Instagram or Facebook, I can't remember, uh, a sort of a blank sided kind of open question. If anyone would like me to come on Friday and do a Facebook live. And my intention was to come back a bit hour or so later and just delete that thing. I was like, this is so crazy. No one's going to even see this. Um, and to my surprise, when I came back to delete it, there were 20, 30 comments saying, please, yes, we'd love that. And so that gave start to 100 consecutive uh, Friday night live streams that I did on my Facebook page. Um, and it just, again, it was just an artistic way of kind of expressing myself and pouring my love of music uh and sharing it with people that were were very appreciative and, and were in need of something inspiring at that crazy time um and then now it has continued on and i'm very grateful to still have a beautiful loyal following everywhere at the same time i am mindful and i am um, for example my cell phone i have certain times of the day where it just completely shuts down i don't even look at it um, just like the, the idea of finding windows of rest, um, that also very much applies to social media and just sharing, putting yourself out there. You have to, um, find just the right boundary of where to stop doing that and, um, just concentrate on your own world a little bit and go a bit more private. So it's a balance, I think. So when people want to find you, what are the, like one or two, uh, social media you use the most? How do they reach you? Uh, I think um, Facebook, Instagram, I'm quite active there. Uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, a bit less so, but still. Um, my YouTube channel, I, I post uh, frequently on. And if people really, really want to get a very close glimpse of what my day-to-day -day life is, I think joining the Patreon community is a great idea because I actually post there every day a little bit of what I have done. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit of our interview for tonight's posts. And uh, just uh, really, I think of these guys, as I said, like uh, a family. I call them my Patreon family. And so I share with them all of my exciting news and big updates. They are the first ones to hear. So uh, that would be the absolute best, closest way to follow my journey with Patreon. That's wonderful. Now, back to your um, very soon to perform uh, mm -hmm. at Virus Idol Hall. Um, when you prepare, are the, these pieces um, mostly new or already you performed before? How do you pr prepare? I mean, you know, I, I'm a violist, a violinist, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, before that, I played the piano because my mom is a pianist. So one day, I was 10 years old. I said, Mom, I want to play the violin. And she said, oh. why? because can you hear me because yes. because 
violin is easier. Only have one line of music to read. <laughs> <laughs> Are you poor pianist? Do you have four lines? So that that's what what I'm into is like, how do you prepare? How do you memorize all these notes? Do you have any um tricks? Uh, I mean, I am a huge believer in the process of it, in the slow work, uh, just really buckling down and taking a certain section and just uh, working on it layer by layer, uh, making sure you are completely at ease with it and you're at a point, I think athletes have this concept, I remember reading it was Michael Jordan or someone had said, you have to get so good that you enter the no think zone. I love that because you you really want to have it mastered so much and you know every layer of that four part fugue, let's say, so well that you allow it to just fly and take a life of its own. And somewhere in the back of your mind, you're kind of still the captain and you're monitoring as it goes, but you're not really right there controlling it choking it to death you're allowing it to be free and fly so um the slow patient practice is so important i know everyone hates it but uh it just cannot take shortcut it has to be done so uh make sure uh, you have enough hours allocated to uh really really address all of the important sections to, to work on them slowly yeah i i totally agree with you and i did not understand that when i was younger but later on when i was preparing a, like an international viola competition and then my pianist said from now on you don't need to play fast just play slow yeah. and so it really paid off i think our muscle uh needs to be sort of a train it's almost like when you're typing and you're typing yeah. typing typing time and you're just training you insert the notes and musical in it so Eventually, if you do enough of them and your body knows how to do it, even without right. our brain trying to control every second of it, right? Exactly. So, so the muscle need, needs directions and mm -hmm. that's wonderful. So, um, yeah. And now, um, if you, that's a very uh, hypothetical question. If you are not a pianist, uh -huh. what kind of profession you see yourself doing? Oh, my goodness. That is such a fun question because uh, I have about 40 different things I want to say. I think the one, <laughs> the one that I gravitate to the most, it still would be in the, in the field of the arts, uh, would be some sort of graphic design or even maybe something in film. Um, I really, really love doing that. I, I like uh, shooting little mini films and then editing them on my little iMovie. <laughs> app mm, very that. rudimentary but mm. hey it works mm. uh so yeah that's that's sort of a dream if i have a you know if i have a second life somehow i come back mm. i'll come back as a some sort of a producer creator person i'll have my own production <laughs> who knows <laughs> yeah. In the meantime, I wanted to, uh, our time is almost end. I want to uh, say thank you to you first, of course. And then I want to thank to our guest, our, our audience and Snow Sugar video, Yukiko. Uh, we just had a, a workshop with Yukiko. So she's my neighbor and she's wow. my, uh, yeah, she's my colleague. And then we have a, a J-O-C-H-E-N. Sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. Oh, it's Jochen. He's one of my Jochen. Jochen family members. Hi, Jochen. Hi, Yuhan. And we have a David full of music from Australia. Yay. Oh, my goodness. Also, yeah. one of my loyal members on Patreon. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in, you know. And uh, Shuck Fen, my friend, is here. He always watches. So, my name is Chinju. I do this um, pretty much every Wednesday afternoon, 5 p.m. And, uh, yeah, we have Jack, Texas. Jack from Houston. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. So, yeah. Any, anyway, um, make some comments when you finish, and you can write in our uh, um, on this uh, Jewel Media. Yeah, Jewel Media is kind of my label, and yeah, you can you can subscribe if you only if you like it. Okay. So I don't ask people <laughs> just to subscribe. <laughs> that is an empty subscription. Yeah. So yeah, anything you want to add on? Uh, I know you have an engagement tonight, so we cannot chat forever. No, thank you. I just want to say thank you. You're such an inspiring figure. I love your work. I've been watching uh, quite a few of your beautiful interviews. So God bless. Keep doing what you're doing. You're amazing. Thank you so much. I can't wait to see you in person. And um, by the way, I want to come to your concert. 
So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And uh, we're going to end this here. And you guys, you know, keep keep safe and then, you know, be happy. It's another another new, new year today. And then I think, you know, just take care of yourself. Like uh, Karina says, we need to take care of ourselves, right? Not Not just take care of somebody else. Yeah. So be your own mommy. I like that. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. And and also I want to just uh, uh you can read everything uh information we talk about uh Karina's uh website it's in the chat it's in the description below and also I'm a filmmaker so you can see a film link that I made um yeah it, it's a feature documentary and you can see the link also in the de description okay Alrighty. All right. So, shall we? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. We're going to end this, okay? Bye, Bye now, everybody. Yeah. Thank Take care. Bye.